Um, yeah, thanks for joining this talk. I just came from Frankfurt and my train had almost four hours delay, which is pretty much the same time you need to get from Frankfurt here. So I'm still a little bit lost in, in transit. So uh, the topic I want to talk today is uh, can NFTs change how we value music? And I'm trying to talk a little bit from my own experience. So I'm uh, just to give you a little bit of a background. I've been a musician for 25 years. So that means I was lucky enough to live from my art for 25 years. And uh, through this, I also got to see many different business models. When I started out in the 90s, if you wanted to make music, uh, sorry, make a living from being a musician, you had to get signed to a label. You know, the means of production, they were in the hands of major labels. You couldn't just get a distribution of your records. So that was kind of my first entry, you know, having that major deal. And um, the next step of this was, you know, being involved in publishing so that somebody actually, I signed over my publishing right. And through this, I got every year rolling advance. So this was another way for me to uh, invest my time and, and perfect my craft. Following after this was the time when you could actually become an independent musician. So I had a present distribution deal with a with the distributor, which means they would f uh, front the cash to produce the records, distribute them, and then they give me a cut. So you see a model there. It was always being dependent on, on the middleman or somebody who kind of called the shots. And eventually, all these barriers fell, and I was able to make a living from being completely independent, pressing my own records, putting them in uh, padded envelopes, bringing them to the mail. So that was kind of the the end of that journey in a way. And we all know what happened after that. Uh, it was the uh, era of streaming that started and the whole uh, kind of business model got disrupted again. Um, the reason why I'm talking about this is because, you know, I, I feel like music NFTs are being heralded as these big uh, kind of groundbreaking tools that allow artists to kind of uh, regain their, their freedom and what you often hear is that uh, the music industry or the, the business model of the music industry is broken. And a while back, Daniel Ek from Spotify issued that statement where he said musicians can no longer just kind of uh, rest uh, on releasing one album a year, but you have to constantly be proactive and uh, put out releases so that you uh, kind of trick the algorithm or that you feed the algorithm, that you continue to stay relevant. And um, it also disrupted how artists are releasing music. If you look at the technological advances, you know, like in the, at the beginning of the century, we had a 45 record. This was kind of the, the carrier for sound. So you had about three minutes that you could fit on one of these. It would go into a jukebox. Then the big breakthrough came with a, a long player where you all of a sudden had 30 minutes that you could fit on the side, you know. So artists all of a sudden had uh, different means to express themselves. They were no longer limited to the short form. The reason why I'm telling this is because, again, streaming kind of put an end to this. And um, what happened is that now you no longer actually put out an album in the classical sense where one song has a relation to the other, but instead you are trying to follow what's called the waterfall model, which means, let's say you have an album of, you collected 10 songs, then you release them one after the other, not as a album at once. And the reason for this is because this way you can continually apply for the playlisting on Spotify, which is, you know, the, the main source of income. If you want to make a living off streaming music, I can tell from my own experience that about 70% of my monthly plays come from Spotify editorial or algorithmic playlists. So that means there's very little a room for an artist to develop your own relationship with your listeners. And maybe also another interesting fact, let's say I have a song that's streaming a million times, that's part of a single, there's another song that's released together with this. You have less, or you have about a conversion of 1% from, let's say, 1 million listeners who like the song to actually make the leap to listen to the other song that comes together with this release. 
So it just shows that it's a very difficult situation you're in as a musician. It's very disadvantageous. And um, essentially, as an artist, you are dealing with a black box. You're at the mercy of a black box. You have to Spotify um, editors who um, curate these playlists and you, you pitch a song when you release a record. And if you're lucky, you know, you, you make uh, a living this month. And if you're unlucky, then uh, very few people will hear about it. So I, don't get me wrong, I really don't want to vilify streaming. I think it's a great way to discover new music. But we also have to understand through this, music has become a commodity, right? And it means you can access all music everywhere, anytime. And what is the focus now is less the artist, but it's more the mood or the situation, right? So this, I feel like, is, is, is a big issue that most of my colleagues and my peers are dealing with. And me being a curious uh, individual, you know, for, for as long as I've been uh, a musician, I was always very much interested in new technologies, uh, either in a studio or means of production or means of distribution. I was always curious. So I think I would say about 2017, I heard about uh, blockchain technology and, you know, shared ledgers and so on. So I, I was just interested to understand how does this work. So for me, the best way to understand something is always to, to uh, uh, run an experiment or just try myself. So uh, that was kind of like what set me on the path of exploring what could be done with music and Web3. And kind of what really, what my initial uh, experience or my initial perspective was that maybe this could be a way for artists to um, have a new model where you can create deeper and more meaningful relationships with your audience. Because this, at the end of the day, this is what it's about, right? If you're not a major artist, you have a fan base and they might not be uh, hundreds of thousands of people, but if you have a few dedicated fans that follow you throughout your life as an artist, this is really like a major pillar of being able to focus on your craft. And I feel like there's also this uh, kind of uh, how can I say this mis misconception that you know music NFT is like this uh, this uh, this thing that will just uh, make every everybody's life easier and will make it possible to uh, live from being an artist and no questions asked, you know. And I feel that it's also just the, the wrong framing. So this is kind of what I want to talk a little bit about today, and. Um, I'm going to use one of my recent projects that I, that I launched early this month. I'm not uh, using it because I think it's the best, but it's because I can explain the thought process behind it. And I think one thing we need to also kind of focus on before we get into the details first is um, that there's a big difference between music NFTs and PFPs or digital collectibles like Top Shot, right? Because music is not collected by rarity trades. I feel like a lot of Collectors, obviously, they go for, okay, this is uh, this, this uh, PFP has a certain value because of these and these characteristics. But with music, it's a different story. And it's quite interesting because, at least uh, t during the time that we've been alive, music has always been about a copy, right? There was never a question of an original. You always had a vinyl record. That was always an approximation of something that uh, existed, you know, in a different place in time. So we're getting to a, a point where we have something that, while not identical, serves the, a similar purpose. And I don't know how, how much you're, you're interested in this, but there's a really great book by Walter Benjamin written in 1935. He already dealt with that question, uh, which is called Das Kunstwerk im Zeitalter seiner technischen Reproduzierbarkeit. I believe that's the correct German title. And it's a fascinating book because he basically looked at the development in photography, right? Like the technical advances that all of a sudden allowed somebody to take a photo of something and then have an almost identical copy. So I always think it's very, very interesting to go back to a point in time where there was like a seismic shift in technology and then try to create an abstraction of this and kind of look at your own situation. And I think photographers made a good job or they did a good job by, you know, going the route of creating uh, limited editions 
uh, signed uh, kind of special prints. So there's already a way how you could, as a photographer, have a, a means of creating a quasi original or an, a copy of, of an original that is valued higher than just, uh, you know, an identical copy. But again, with music, it's different because music is a time based art. So if you try to look at it from this perspective, where do you want to put your signature on the music, right? It's, it's something you perceive in the moment. So that is the question that uh, I try to investigate. Like what is the actual value of a music NFT? What might somebody actually pay for and then have a value, that's something that's create value for their life, right? This is always the, the question that, that I'm, I'm dealing with. If I'm a musician, and somebody buys my record and they listen to it and it enriches their lives. This is kind of the, the, the transfer of, of goods in a way, right? This is what I can bring to the table. So that was kind of the, the thought, like what can I provide that somebody is then willing to pay a premium? Because you have to understand in the, in the music world, there's this price tag that's firmly established, a piece like a single track if you want to buy a single track, it's 99 cents or a dollar or a euro or whatever your currency is. This is kind of accepted and it's very, very hard to change, change people's perceptions why they should pay more than this one euro. And so I try to think, one thing my music definitely is not is a financial investment, right? Like a lot of people, they invest their money into digital collectibles, they expect a return. So I am very clear up front, like this this money that you're paying right now, it's probably going to be worth, worth less in the future than what you've paid for, right? So it's not, a com it's not something that you trade like a stock. It's the same with my records. I have very few uh, copies of my records that are worth like 100 or 200 euros. Most of them are actually worth less than what they were originally issued for. And this is something I just wanted to be very clear that, you know, I had to find a different angle why somebody would be interested to pay more money for this. Another thing my music also is not, it's not something that you can use for social signaling. So for instance, if you have a crypto punk and you put this into your, into your um, uh, Twitter um, profile, it shows you were early, either you're very rich or you were very early, right? So you can signal somehow, okay, this is my, my position in this, in, this, uh, in this situation right now. So again, Music is not doing the same thing there. So I realized, you know, kind of taking all these factors into consideration, the one thing that I could deliver and that I feel also has a real value for the, for the collector and which doesn't fall into any of these categories is to create an experience, to create a unique shared experience centered around my music. So this was kind of like my initial hypothesis and this is kind of the rabbit hole I went down. So now we can finally change the slide. Oops, all right. So that was actually the title of the, of the record that I've, or the project that I um, put together. Actually, I don't know how to go back here. All right, so this is, we're talking about some music. This is actually me in the studio working on the record. Okay, so quantum rainbow is what? What's the what's the idea behind it, or what what kind of uh, what did I try to achieve that is different to other music NFTs? So I try to take a, a book from the playbook of uh, like these big entities, you know, like Disney Plus, where serialized content is produced in one chunk and then um, split into smaller sections and released in regular intervals, right? So through this, you have this communal experience, people who are kind of invested in the content, in the story, in the experience, they congregate, they can, you know, have some kind of uh, communion through this. And I was very, very um, kind of eager to somehow replicate this, obviously on a much smaller scale, so I'm not going to compete with uh, Netflix or anybody else here. 
And um, so this was kind of my, my, my um, jumping off point. And Quantum Rainbows is an interesting um, example because it's a piece of music that is too long for a single, but also too short for an, for an album, right? So it sits right in this, at this threshold where also prior to music NFTs, I really had no real outlet for, for this type of music. And, you know, if you have an album, usually it's written from the ground up. So you start with one song, then you do another song, and eventually you have this body of work. So I actually went the other way around. I took one 16-minute uh, composition, and then I extracted four them uh, thematic sections and um, uh, tokenized them. So let's, let me just show you quickly how this looks. So on the top, you can see this is the whole. This is Quantum Rainbows, the, the full experience, so to speak. And then you can see I took these chunks out and it's kind of like a reverse puzzle, right? So this was kind of like what I was very keen to experiment with to get this emotional attachment. So if you were a collector and you would get the first piece and the second and the third and the fourth and eventually you would listen to the full uh, uh, piece that you know spans 60 minutes, you would have a very different kind of relationship to them because you invested in it, you, because you've been part of that story. So this was kind of like um, my, my thought process here. So that's why I came up with this idea to call it a time-limited shared experience. Because this is similar like when you have a favorite drama and you watch an episode and then you think about it during the week and you might also talk with other people about it. I just wanted to have something that happens in one particular moment, especially when, we, when, when I wanted to somehow compete with streaming, which is always available everywhere, anytime, right? So, creating anticipation for the next release, this was something very important. And then again, providing the sense of wonder, how everything relates, you know, almost like this puzzle that unfold, un unfolds in front of your eyes. This was like my, my experiment, something I really wanted to see how, how this plays out. So, to give you a little bit of an idea, this was the, the release plan. So, these were basically the four sections of the of Quantum Rainbows, and they were released bi-weekly. So starting 28th of January, every two weeks I would drop one of these um, uh, single music NFT releases. And it was a great experience because I had the full support from Min Songs, the platform that I was working with there. So we had Twitter spaces every time one of these releases dropped. So you would get a kind of like a conversation going with the collectors or with the curious uh, kind of uh, bystanders who might also want to uh, kind of get involved and mostly to create this uh, sense of community for the collectors because I feel like this is you know where streaming can't compete with if you have some kind of um, social interaction with other people who feel the same way about something that you feel very dear about. So, once these four um, sections were released, um, as a last step, I would take a collector snapshot. So, I'm just trying to tell you a little bit about the, um, the, the journey that, uh, that I took the collectors on. So, two weeks after the release of the final section of section four, I took the snapshots, snapshot of all the wallet addresses that collected the four individual pieces. And this was then basically the uh, addition that I would mint the full experience to. So this was kind of, again, creating something that you couldn't buy with, with money, so to speak, right? You had to be there, you had to be in for the, for the ride. And it wasn't actually that it was very costly, but it was that you had to also somehow, you know, show that, um, uh, you know, time is our most valuable asset at the moment. So if you're actually willing to invest your time in something and, and kind of in, into the community and be a member of of that of that team that is uh, kind of uh, um, yeah enjoying this this special moment that is only happening in in one particular uh, situation. So this was you know the the feeling that everybody got who in, in, uh, kind of invested in their collection at this point, and then they would get uh, the uh, the full version minted and uh, airdropped into their wallet. But this was not all, because uh, uh, yeah, this is the the final release as they would then receive it. But um, this uh, music NFT had another function. It had uh, what everybody, it's like a buzzword, you know, the utility. But in, in my case, actually the full version of Quantum Rainbows had this uh, built-in um, link into the metadata of the, 
of the NFT. And this would then link you to a token gated website where this uh, NFT would serve as a, as a key. And through this, you would unlock a, a form where you could input your shipping information. So this was kind of the moment where we trans to traverse the, the virtual world and then we entered the real world because basically what um, what happened as a next step and this is kind of like where the uh, the NFT almost got kind of like a magical property is, well, is that it uh, connected me and the collectors in the virtual, no longer in the virtual world but in the physical world and they would actually get a, um, an, a cassette tape of this um, composition right so we are we are kind of going full circle here because I have to go back to the beginning of the story where I said it's a kind of odd piece of music. It's too long for a single, too short for an album because this is what I would uh, kind of produce as a so-called beat tape, you know, when I, when I kind of uh, um, uh, collaborate with a rapper and I kind of think what music would kind of be like a special um, kind of uh, baseline for him to, to, uh, to create rhymes, I would put this tape together for him, you know, these little skits and beats and interludes, and I put it on the tape and I, went, I would send it out to him. So that's kind of where this inspiration came from. I thought, like, how cool would it be that the collectors who been with me the whole time for this ride would then in the end be rewarded with an actual physical um, kind of artifact, right? And me actually putting this into a padded envelope and writing a little note, creating an even deeper and more meaningful relationship with them. So this was uh, kind of the, um, the, the whole idea behind it. And maybe just to kind of sum it up once more, I made this little diagram. So you had these individual sections that you could collect. And once you um, had kind of passed the threshold after the final release and there was a collector snapshot, you would get the full composition via airdrop. This would then serve to unlock the token gate where you could input your the details where you wanted the, the artifact to be shipped and then FedEx would deliver the magic to you. So for me it was a very interesting um, experience because again it was a thought at first and something I really wanted to try out how it translates. Um, I was able to use all the tooling that is already available in Web3 so no programming is necessary. You have so many great um, services that allow you to set up these uh, these um, token gates and to be able to airdrop NFTs you know everything is 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 free and available you just have to do your research and for me it was really you know experimenting with an alternate way to release music and provide a different meaning to to music in in the web3 context and for me, the most important thing was really that it created a meaningful interaction between me and those who supported my music. And this is, you know, I have people who've been who've been supporting me for 20 years, buying my music, sending me little messages. And, you know, this is really what I feel like, the, that's the most important investment. And this is something where I feel like streaming has detached me from, that I have no understanding who the people are that actually listen to my music. I was making a joke on Twitter a while back that for me the only way to understand who's listening to my music on, on Spotify is by seeing the names of the playlists that actually my songs are being added to and I have some of the great examples posted uh, I think one is like hipster brunch <laughs> uh, I, I can't recall but it's, it's really funny so this is the only back channel I have in the, in this world so I was really uh, kind of pleased with making new friends, making new allies, getting new supporters to this project because it was kind of the first kind of large scale project, music project that I did in Web3. And maybe also for those uh, aspiring musicians who want to get their feet wet, like my resume is really you have to create your own story. There's no kind of uh, way that fits everyone or uh, kind of like a, a set path to get rich. You know, this is something uh, I feel like there's a lot of snake oil salesmen in, in the in the game that you have to be very wary of who tell you these stories. But if you really want to have um, kind of a, a different outlet, you know, I don't see this anytime soon replacing my income from streaming, from Bandcamp, from all the other means that I make music as a musician. But this is a great addition, and I'm I'm I have a lot of 
belief in, in the future that you know this will grow and there will be new platforms and new ways to have these meaningful interactions. So this is something I'm really excited about. And yeah, thanks a lot for listening. Maybe we wanna, if there's some questions. Thanks so much.